live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Trying to build on the gains of Friday. Equity futures up four tenths of one percent. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York City, we begin with the big issue. What a week. Goldman Sachs set to cut 3,200 jobs ahead of earnings. Chair Powell set to react to softer wage growth with the latest CPI read just around the corner. We're watching the data. Payrolls. The CPI data. Chair Powell. Powell is just going to reinforce this idea that they're slowing down now. Now we're debating, are they going to go 25s? A difficult balance for Powell in the month ahead. Uh, in the months ahead is going to be to try to continue on this path of moderation. They're very concerned of being the Fed that, that paused too early. Friday's stops market report. This has the signs of being a soft landing report. They really want to get to a level that squeezes the life out of lagging indicators of inflation. That's exactly what they're after. You have to take this Fed at its word that if they don't see improvement or in, and persistent improvement, that can go a bit further. It comes down to the economic data. You can't write off another 50. You have a setup for the Fed to over tighten monetary policy. Joining us now to discuss is BlackRock's Marilyn Watson, Chris Mamani of Lafayette College. To the both of you, thanks for being with us. And before we look forward, let's look back just a little bit to Friday. Marilyn, can you tell me what's more important, that labour market report that came out at 8.30 or the ISM that came out 90 minutes later? Well, I think they're both, they're both important and they're both suggesting um, very different things about the economy. So the labour market report overall was generally pretty positive, although obviously, um, you know, the markets also took well to the fact that average hourly earnings were down uh, or weakening um, and that. But overall, I think the labour market data still showed a pretty robust economy. On the other hand, obviously, the ISM was pretty negative in terms of the overall path of the economy and economic activity. I think really the key, though, is going to be this week in terms of the inflation data, in terms of CPI. I think the Fed, um, along with other central banks, is still very much focused on inflation. I think February is going to be a live meeting, February the 1st. And I think really that the CPI data is something that, above anything else, the Fed is really going to be concentrating on this week. Marilyn, when you say live, what does that mean? That they could go 25 or 50 or not at all? Yeah, so I think the debate is probably between 50 and 25. Um, I think the bar would be incredibly high for the Fed to, to not move at all. I think they've, they've continued to really indicate that they're going to continue to um, hike rates until they feel that they're at this you know, restrictive level, that they've got inflation on a path, on a trajectory that's definitely going to come down to a sustainable lower level. Um, so I think it really is between probably 25 and 50, um, unless we have a really, really outsized event in terms of the CPI data this week. Krishna, Chairman Powell speaks tomorrow morning. On the one hand, I've got to ask the question, you know, which one is it? On the one hand, right now, the survey data says things are bad. On the other hand, you look at the labour market report and headline payrolls say things are pretty decent. Krishna, which one is it? Well, the Fed has been pretty clear about this for quite some time. That is, what they are focused on singularly is really the labour market data. And if uh, the rest of the economy slows and labour market remains tight, they have already told us that they are going to continue to tighten. So I, I think I don't expect Chair Powell to say anything new uh, anytime soon. Uh, and, and he may actually take the opportunity to reinforce the point that he has been making over the last, uh, last, few, uh, last few quarters. The odd quirk of the labour market report on Friday, Krishna, was that wages softened and unemployment fell to 3.5 per cent. And I guess I've got to ask you, Krishna, how sustainable you think that is. Can wages continue to decelerate without unemployment rising? Well, I, I, I think they can. And I think if you look at uh, the kind of the uh, under the hood, there are some really good uh, data points to point out uh, that uh, that may actually come about without significant rise in uh, unemployment rate. You know, temporary workers, hours work, all of those are simply pointing out that while people are not letting their uh, workers go, they're cutting down the amount of uh, amount of output that they're getting out of those workers. So I think employment data prob or employment number perhaps is the lagging indicator in the, in, in this labor report. Marilyn, do you agree with that assessment? 
Yes, I think I think it is a lagging indicator. I also think that there are some very structural issues still in the labour market um, as a result of COVID. So when you look at um, the, the trajectory that you would have had in terms of people employed in areas such as healthcare and other services, there's a massive deficit there compared to the number of people employed in those sectors now. So I do think that you have some support in areas um, that you know, have been negatively, negatively impacted by, um, by COVID. Um, and I do think that also overall it, it is a lagging indicator as well. So I think you can see um, you know, the unemployment rate maybe you know, rise a little bit, but I think it's going to remain relatively uh, supported for, for some time. 25 minutes away from the open and back equity futures right now, positive a half of 1%. The path through the rest of this week, pretty clear. We have Chairman Powell tomorrow morning. You have CPI on Thursday, then JP Morgan earnings coming up on Friday. Mike McKee, Chairman Powell tomorrow morning. What are you looking for? Not a whole lot. Uh, it is not a, an event where he would be talking about the economy. It's on central bank independence, and it's a panel discussion with a bunch of other central bankers. But uh, here's the story going into it. Uh, when you look at what happened on Friday, you brought this up at the top of the show, and you asked the question of what, if it, what does it mean. Uh, we saw jobs, and we saw the ISM report hitting the two-year note yield. Which one is more important? Are jobs telling us inflation is going to go away faster, or is ISM telling us we're going to have recession. That's the question all over Wall Street. And as you mentioned, Jay Powell speaking tomorrow probably is not going to give us a real answer at this point. However, Thursday we get CPI. That'll be the sort of the marker for Wall Street on what we get at 25 or 50 on February 1st. Friday, Michigan inflation expectations. I, I'll call that a half of a half of a number, half of a data point, because that has mattered to the markets in the past. But other than than that, not much going on this week. Now, the real debate is about whether the Fed is going to go too far or not, and that'll play into the decision for February 1st. Remember this quote from the minutes uh, last month, an unwarranted easing in financial conditions would complicate the committee's effort to restore price stability? Well, you take a look at this. We are seeing an easing in financial conditions, and we saw that most definitely with the two-year note yield. This is the Bloomberg uh, issue. When you get up to zero, you get up to the red line there, that uh, starts to get uh, into completely easy conditions. That's not what the Fed wants to see. So expect, if he has a chance, Jay Powell to sound a bit hawkish, but expect, expect other Fed officials talking this week and next to sound hawkish as well. Hey, Mike, thank you. Just a monster rally into the front end of the bond market on Friday. The two-year yield dropping by more than 20 basis points off the back of that softer than expected ISM. This is what City's got to say about it. Andrew Hollenhorst says this. We continue to think Fed concern about loosening financial conditions amidst tightening labor markets imply unappreciated hawkish risk, including a 50 basis point hike at the start of February. This is even more the case after the dramatic decline in Treasury yields last Friday. Krishna, do you agree with that? Yes, wholeheartedly. I think if you, if you think about it, if the Fed wanted to reinforce its message to the market, this was really a perfect opportunity for them to do that. Whether it is 25 basis points or 50 basis points from the impact on the economy really doesn't matter that much. But from a signaling standpoint, it'll matter a great deal. Basically, what they would tell the market is they are on the case, they will remain on the case, and we are not there yet and don't expect us to get there anytime soon. We've got to ask ourselves, not just what Chairman Powell is going to say, Marilyn, but how much weight those words carry. Do you think they've lost a little bit of weight over the last few months? Um, I don't know that they've necessarily lost any weight. I think that they've been very consistent. Chair Powell has been consistent in reinforcing that they really want to get to a point where they're you know, above probably the neutral rate, where they're maybe in restricted territory and where they do feel that you know, inflation is on a sustainable lower path. And so I don't think they have lost the weight. I think that they're really signaling that they're willing to do as much as it takes. Um, and that now isn't yet the time to start suggesting that they're going to, to pause or even start cutting. And I think maybe the market is a bit premature in actually predicting that the, the Fed might even start to cut this year. I think that's not necessarily our base case. This equity market on Friday, 38.95 at a close on the S&P 500. Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley says 3,900, easy sell. This is what he had to say to start the week. With both sell and buy side consensus so aligned, that look for a dip in the first half and a rip in the second half. Everyone is starting to wonder how this view could be wrong. We think it's in the magnitude of the move lower, led by much weaker earnings and a Fed committed to fighting inflation. Mike Wilson says 3,900 
is an easy sale. Christian Mamani, I have to say, reading through your notes, you think the real pain trade here is an equity market that could get back to 4,500. Can you weigh those two risks for me? Sure. So I, I think Mike, to some extent, may be right. That is, we are still very much in the trading range with respect to what the Fed is articulating as to their uh, path forward. Having said that, given where positioning is, and if we get favorable data coming through over the next uh, few quarters, the market is certainly not positioned for a 4,500 by mid-year. And I think that's why it will be the ultimate pain trade for the market at the moment. That's the equity side of the story. Let's talk about the bond market side of the story. Marilyn, lining up to buy fixed income in 2023, almost every single mm. investor I've spoken to. Marilyn, what's the risk that yields actually go against that view? Well, so I think we're certainly in a far better position uh, than we have been at, you know, at the beginning of last year. And I think given the massive repricing that we saw last year, fixed income, I think, is a relatively attractive asset class now. Particularly, I think, when you talk about risks, we like the, the carry and the income that you can get, particularly in sort of the risk-free area of the bond curve. So if you look at the front end in treasuries, when you look at um, little or no duration in terms of high-quality investment grade, um, and other asset classes, um, maybe in um, the, the MBS market as well, then I think actually there are a lot of attractive opportunities. And the key there, I think, is to really understand the liquidity, is to understand the risk reward dynamics, it's to understand the impact of the duration, and to really focus on those aspects where you can really get some very, very decent carry um, and some decent returns. But you are looking at relatively low risk, even if you do see a change in uh, you know, the interest rate dynamics. And I think that's the key to really make sure that you're not overly uh, interest rate sensitive in your portfolio. Marilyn Watson, Christian Mamani, sticking with us. Looking forward to the conversation coming up in just a moment. Mike Gapen of Bank of America, publishing just moments ago, we do not see the Powell Fed as facing a new conundrum. The Fed should worry less about markets pricing cuts in 2023. If the Fed commits itself too strongly to no cuts in 23, then it risks leaving policy too tight for too long. That was Mike Gapen of B of A literally about 60 seconds ago. We'll pick up on that a little bit later. Coming up on this programme, DC finally delivers a speaker in the House. I am now ready to take the oath of office. I want to ask the Dean of the House. Now will the speaker designate raise his right hand. Well, that took a while. Plus, President Biden touching down in Mexico City. We'll catch up with AMH over in Mexico in just a moment. I am now ready to take the oath of office. Speaker designate. Raise his right hand. Do you solemnly swear that you will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic? Yes, I do. Congratulations and God speak. Well, that took a while. Speaker McCarthy winning the gavel after a historic four-day battle. The House returning to business amid a potential hurdle over the rules package. This coming as President Biden travels to Mexico City to meet his Mexican and Canadian counterparts. Our team coverage begins right now with AMH in Mexico City and Emily Wilkins in Washington. Emily, first to you. Walk us through the president's agenda through the next couple of days. Well, Jonathan, this afternoon he's going to be joining along with First Lady Jill Biden, really just a welcoming ceremony by AMLO. And then him and AMLO will have the Mexican president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, more colloquially known as AMLO. They will have their own bilateral meeting. And really the focus of this meeting, Jonathan, is going to be migration. They just struck this deal uh, last week that the president announced. Mexican officials are also on board with this deal. On top of that, another big one is going to be shared security. And the White House talks about the fact that they are going to talk about the fentanyl crisis. Mexico, Jonathan, you can imagine, is going to point to the fact that they just got a huge arrest with El Chapo's son, which the U.S. has put pressure on Mexican authorities because they they consider him one of the ma major traffickers when it comes to fentanyl. This is a huge issue in the United States with uh, John Kirby, Admiral Kirby of the National Security Council, talking about the fact on Friday that since August they saw an increase and in what the Border Patrols have been able to um, take in is 20,000 pounds of fentanyl. On top of all that, when it comes to the drug trafficking, migration, then they will talk about trade. One of the big disputes 
Canada, Jonathan, and the United States have with Mexico some nationalist policies when it comes to energy. Emily, two points there. The first one was the border. The second one was trade. The Republicans want to focus firmly on the first one, on the border. Emily, how united do you think Republicans can be in the year ahead? Well, certainly Republicans are united on some measures. We're likely to see that later today with a vote on the rules package. There have been some Republicans who have raised concerns, but at this point, it is expected to pass. We're also going to see Republicans come together today. You remember that funding that Democrats passed that gives more money to the IRS? Well, Republicans will be voting today to withdraw that money. Now, of course, that's not likely to pass the Senate or get to Biden's desk, but it's going to start being things that show that Republicans are more united. I think the biggest questions looming over everyone right now, and Republicans have told me they're very aware of this, are things about the debt limit. They might not be happening for a number of months, but we've already heard lawmakers like Chip Roy come out and say we need to start working on it now so we don't go down to the final minute. And I've had lawmakers like Patrick McHenry tell me this is really one of the most important things that Republicans need to do. So I think some things on their agenda you're going to see a lot of unity on. The question is really those big bills that are going to sort of make or break uh, the U.S. in the next year. AMH, is this president ready for a debt ceiling fight later this year? Well, we already heard from Karine Jean-Pierre, the president's press secretary, speaking to reporters on Air Force One during Biden's trip to El Paso yesterday, Jonathan, and she said that they will not allow this issue to be hostage-taking. What the Republicans want is something we have to see the Democrats potentially negotiate on and something they do not want to do. Republicans basically are saying, if you want us to be able to lift the debt ceiling, then we need concessions from you when it comes to spending. And that is why this is going to be a huge fight, because the Democrats obviously have control of the Senate, but the Republicans just have a very slim majority in the House. AMH in Mexico City, we'll catch up with you over the next day or so. Emily Wilkins, good to have you back down in Washington, D.C. as well. Goldman Sachs put out a note at the end of 22, looking out to 23, on this very issue. And this is what they had to say. Raising the debt limit, probably not soon. Probably not easy. Running down the roughly $500 billion cash balance could finance the deficit until August, but funds could run dry as soon as July and as late as October. Back with us for a final thought is Krishna Mamani and Marilyn Watson. Marilyn, I want to come to you. I hear a lot of people say I don't care. They want to know should they care and they want to know when should they care when it concerns the debt ceiling. Um, so I, I think they should care, but. Um, whether it's in the immediate future, I, I think is less. I think, as I say, the market is still very much focused on other issues such as inflation, the labour market, um, the, the other data that we've seen. But as we do, as the year does progress, then um, as in previous years, it could become another issue that the market really focuses on. As you know, the market really only focuses on one thing at a time. But I think it's certainly something that if it does look like it's going to become an issue, then it is something that the market will eventually focus on. I think this year, though, overall, is a very different year where the market has a lot of different things to focus on as well. When you look at um, you know, China very, very rapidly reopening, when you look at the energy crisis in Europe seems to be um, you know, rapidly abating as well, there are a lot of different dynamics that also I think the market wasn't necessarily focusing on last year, that this year, I think, add a different tone as well. So yeah. the debt ceiling is one of many issues, um, but I think for the time being, it's not going to be the focus. I think you now do. Your colleague, Rick Reader, told me a long, long time ago, markets can only focus on the shark closest to the boat. And the shark closest to the boat right now is not the debt ceiling debate. But, Krishna, we've got division between parties within parties. And I think people are asking the question, do we face the risk of a 2011 repeat, Krishna? Well, I mean, we certainly face a risk. Whether that is a measurable risk or not, I, I can't really tell you. Uh, uh, from the standpoint that by, by August, September, the economic outlook could be very different than what we have today. And therefore, uh, I, I think the gravity of a potential uh, uh, two, two, 2011 repeat would be far more acute in August than it seems today. And I think that will probably help get it through. Again, th there's no certainty. It's politics and it's difficult to predict. But that's not something that uh, I'm too worried about at the moment. Krishna, with that in mind, is that a worse outlook for the economy but a better outlook for the market? Uh, yes, absolutely. I think the worst, worst outlook for the economy, for sure, in terms of uh, slowing from very high levels of uh, both a nominal and real growth rates. But the real question at that point would be how close are we to a potential recession? And if we go down this path of playing, uh, uh, playing with the largest uh, capital market in the world, you know, how do we want to risk tipping that into uh, a recession that was avoidable?
So let's finish on this. Marilyn, if we get into this situation where this risk is measurable, it's prominent, and it's something we have to grapple with, tell me how the market responds to it. Do you expect Treasuries to respond how they always respond, which is with a bid, a rally, lower yields? Um, yeah, so it, it, it's possible, but I think also the dynamic will really be very much, um, I think, you know, Krishna was right when, he, when you think about um, the impact on the overall economy and depends what state the economy is in then. And at the moment, the huge amount of debate is whether it's going to be a soft landing, whether it's going to be a hard landing or somewhere in between. And I think that really will make a very big difference in terms of the Fed's response and in terms of uh, the Treasury response as well. So, you know, if you look at historical, um, you know, performance, then it's is likely, but I think it really is very important to look at it in the overall context of the of the market and, and, and the overall economic performance. Marilyn Krishna to the two of you. Thank you. Marilyn Watson, Krishna Mamani, two of the best on fixed income and on the equity market as well. Your equity market right now, S&P 500 futures up five or six tenths of 1% on the S&P. Adding to the gains of Friday, payroll's got all the credit. That move though in the bond market was all off the back of the ISM. In contraction, big move lower, dropped by about seven points from the previous month. Was that just the weather or is something worse going on here in the US economy? We moved about 20 basis points at the front end on Friday. We're down another one basis point on a two-year today. Your two-year yield, 423, call it 424 if you like. On a 10-year right now, 357.63, yields higher there by just a couple of basis points. So a little bit of steepening coming back into a very, very inverted yield curve. Coming up, the morning calls and later, RB advisors Dan Suzuki seeing a change in stock leadership. More on that with Dan around the opening bell. Your opening bell, seven minutes away. Starting to work our way through the trading week. Chairman Powell tomorrow morning. On Thursday, we get CPI data in America. And on Friday, it's JP Morgan numbers. Going into that, equity futures up six tenths of 1%, about four or five minutes away from the opening bell on the NASDAQ up by seven tenths of 1%. Into the bond market. Mention this move lower we saw on Friday. Two year yields dropped like a stone by 21 basis points. Off the back of an ISM services survey in negative contraction territory. Not good news for this Federal Reserve if they're trying to avoid a hard landing. The good news was in the labor market report. Now, your outlook might depend on the data you're looking at. And at the moment, I think you can cherry pick the data and explain whatever you want about your outlook and justify it, perhaps. Yields lower at the front end by a basis point. That's the price action of the bond market. Let's get you some morning calls. Piper Sandler upgrading Oracle to overweight, 104 price target, citing growth in cloud revenue and operating profits. Jeffries upgrading CureVac to buy, 21 price target, seeing potential in early trials of new COVID and flu vaccines. And finally, Bank of America double upgrading Zillow to a buy from underperform, expecting new initiatives to lead to higher revenues. Up next, looking for a change in leadership. Dan Suzuki of RB Advisors. Coming off the back of the biggest weekly gain on the S&P 500 since November. That was last week, the biggest weekly gain since November. Trying to build on that this morning. Good morning to you. About seconds away from the opening bell. Equity futures up by six tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the NASDAQ 100, up three quarters of 1%. On a Russell, up by eight tenths of 1%. There's your opening bell. Switch at the board and get to the bond market. Monster move on Friday off the back of that ISM. Yields lower, much lower at the front end. Trying to bounce this morning on a 10-year yield up by a couple of basis points to 357.82. The ECB signals there's more hikes to come. Euro dollar reclaims 107. 107.17 on Euro dollar. Positive there by seven tenths of 1% and crew trying to rally here. We'll talk about China and reopening with Damien Sassar of Bloomberg Intelligence in about 15 minutes. Look out for that conversation. Crewed up by 2.5% to $75 and around about 60 cents. We run about 25 seconds into the open here. Equities up by a half of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq up by 9 tenths of 1%. One name to watch at the open, Lulu. Lululemon plunging after the company cut its margin forecast on surging costs. Abby has more on this one. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, yes, Lululemon appears to be the first First, maybe the only, but certainly the first of the retailers to admit that holiday 2022, well, it wasn't so good. And this is not a new story. If you recall, in early December, they reported a brutal quarter, all about margins not coming in where they were supposed to, profitability uh, not as high as expected. And so this is weighing on other retailers, well, not as much anymore, Under Armour and VF Corp coming off the lows. But relative to those gross 
gross margins, it's a pretty significant shift that they have made uh, in a press statement initially this morning, or, uh, and that is that gross margins, instead of being up 10 to 20 basis points in the fiscal first fourth quarter, the quarter we're in now, now down 100 basis points, now they, or 1%. So this now means four straight quarters of contracting gross margins. My thought as similar to early December, get over to that Lululemon on December and see what great deals they have. But this, of course, translates into weakness for the stock, the worst day for the stock of the year. Now another uh, down year, knowing that the year is young. But the reason this matters, well, actually, it's actually up just slightly on the year there. But last year, a down year, John. On the first time since uh, 2013. Will this company be able to get it together in time? We don't know, but uh, perhaps not the best way to start the year after having been higher last week. That's for sure. Abby, thank you. Stocks hammered down by about 10% in early trading. Different story for Alibaba, the stock leading Chinese tech gains, with the PPOC announcing an end to its two year crackdown on the sector. Ed Ludlow has more. Hey, Ed. Yeah, good morning, Jonathan. Beyond sort of being caught up as part of the China reopening trade, there are two key catalysts with Alibaba stock this morning. The first, a comment from a top central bank official in China, Guo Shuxing, who basically says that the two-year crackdown on China tech focused on those 14 internet companies and their financial business is basically or essentially coming to an end. At the heart of this story has been Jack Ma and him stepping back from Ant Group, the financial affiliate of Alibaba. The other key catalyst was on Saturday, the company appointing 10 individuals, giving them voting rights, which essentially strips Mars control from the company. It's been a really interesting story. You look at Alibaba stock over the course of 2022, very difficult year. And while that chart doesn't fully demonstrate it, from the trough in October to present, we've actually rebounded some 70%. A part of that is the reopening trade, this idea that growth estimates for China in 23 are improving. Then there's the specific equity story. You look at analysts' calls on this stock, the percentage of buy ratings improving in recent weeks. Goldman Sachs, for example, has added Alibaba to its conviction list, both on this kind of reopening and recovering conviction call, but also that improving regulatory environment. And then Alibaba, Alibaba is Morgan Stanley's new top paint pick for this year. They're also interested in other internet stocks in China, like Meituan. I think there's kind of some growing optimism about the growth story in China for 23, particularly for tech, particularly for e-commerce. That said, we're still concerned about the spread of COVID-19. Big time. That stock is up by 4%. Ed, thank you. As always, it's not just China Tech. EM Equities. EM Equities are up more than 20% since the lows of October. As I say, we'll catch up with Damien Sasser in just a moment on that. But what a run. They say there's always a bull market somewhere. That's where that bull market is right now. The big banks here in the United States kick off earnings on Friday. JP Morgan goes first. Goldman next week. They're set to kick things off on a gloomy note this week, though, preparing to announce more than 3,000 job cuts as soon as this week. Shanali, run us through it. Certainly, John, you have a tense week over at Goldman Sachs with a headcount reduction of that size. But listen, we knew it was coming, and it's actually a number that was less than it could have been. At the end of the day, Goldman has grown dramatically, and this number is bigger by the amount in terms of the cuts you're seeing. But let me put this in a perspective for you a little bit, because as we head into bank earnings season, it's a focus here on profit. What levers do the banks have to keep costs under control? And if you look at how much net income has dropped off between 2021 and 2022, if they're estimated to bring in that $11.8 billion of net income that analysts are expecting for the full year, that works out to $239,000 per worker. That is way less than you saw per worker just a year before that at four hundred ninety thousand dollars so uh, four hundred ninety hundred thousand dollars so you have really have a steep 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 drop off here not in uh, not in just kind of the pure uh, employee count if you look at it there it's really not even bringing you back down to where you were even in 2020 it's barely bringing you back down to where you were a year ago but what it means here to make a cut of this size it makes a big difference to Goldman's bottom line which is why you're seeing the stock really react positively to a lot of these plans that Goldman is putting out for Sh you. Shanali, they report next Tuesday yeah. on the same day we hear from Morgan Stanley as well. Bit of a change at the top this morning. Run us through the Huge latest. Huge change at the top. Jonathan Pruzan was the chief operating officer, was the former CFO. Remember, John Pruzan has been there decades. He's a top de deputy to James Gorman. By the way, when you look at the top ranks of Morgan Stanley, now you have John Pruzan gone. About a year or so, Shelley O'Connor, a different deputy, had left. You have the top of Morgan Stanley changing, and therefore the line of succession honing in. 
puts the eyes very firmly on two particular folks. That is Andy Saperstein, who runs Wealth. That is uh, Ted Pick, who is uh, the king of the institutional securities business. And by the way, the reason this is so fun to watch, John, it is a competitive, competitive year, especially for Mr. Pick over there. Watch those trading figures come in. Remember, Goldman has been neck and neck with that business at Morgan Stanley Equities that they loved to win that for so long. I'm looking forward to your coverage that really kicks off on Friday. Shanali, thank you. JP Morgan earnings just around the corner on Friday. Those two banks we mentioned, Goldman and Morgan Stanley, coming up next week. From financials to tech, you know the story, the job cuts rolling in. Here's what Richard Bernstein of RB Advisors had to say. This was a sector that was in full-fledged bubble mode for a couple of years. They hired indiscriminately, and now they're feeling the, the downward pressure on that. There's still too, way too much talk about will the old leadership regain form, right? In other words, should you look at this as a buying opportunity in this old speculative leadership? I think that's a very bad sign because it shows that there still hasn't been full capitulation yet in these sectors of the economy. I want to continue this conversation with Dan Suzuki of RB, he joins us right now. Dan, I think you guys are really leading the effort on this front, and I'm not sure many people have capitulated to your view just yet. So, Dan, let's start there. How long do you think it's going to take to unwind the excess that's been built up, not just over the last couple of years, but maybe over the last decade? Yeah, John, good morning. I, I, clearly, it's going to take a lot longer. I mean, this is just par for the course for how, you know, bubbles deflate. Uh, when was the last time you saw a bubble deflate overnight? It takes years to, to really change the psychology and change the positioning around, you know, how people view these things. I mean, for years, we've been taught that, you know, the hopes and the stories were, were really all that you had to care about. But now that when it comes down to these points where liquidity is tightening, the economy is slowing, you have to come back to fundamentals and profits. And these are areas where people's expectations are way too high. It's going to take time for those things to sh change. Clearly, they are shifting. You know, but I think it's going to take you know a lot longer, a lot cheaper valuations, um, and people just stop it. You know, people changing the way you know they think of these as you know huge opportunities for these stocks. I mean, one way to think about it, you know, a rule of thumb for bubbles is you know it typically takes you know a decade to re regain those highs. You know, at, from the bubble peaks. You know, it took you know that long over. It took 14 years in the case of the tech bubble. It took you know that long in in, in the case of most bubbles. So I think that that's kind of a starting point for expectations. And Dan, this is not a new conversation for you and I. We talked about this, that lost decades aren't unusual. They're not unheard of. Do you think we could really be in for one at the index level in the United States for large caps? You know, I think a, a lost decade, John, is, is kind of extreme, at least for a, for a base case scenario. But certainly, as you look at the U.S. relative to pretty much everything out there, you know, it does face a lot of headwinds. I mean, the U.S. is still you know, probably the only major market in the world that's still as actually quite expensive relative to history. Uh, and that's very much because of that bubble concentration in those bubble assets we mentioned. I mean, you know, the, the concentration that the tech heavy sectors has come down from 50 percent to the low 40s. Uh, but that's, you know, there's probably a lot further for that to come down. And having such a high concentration in those bubble assets, which, again, are going to take a long time you know, to regain those highs, it does make for a tough decade outlook, you know, for, for the U.S. market and the index, which is why, you know, I think that, you know, the real opportunity is people, you know, look to take advantage of these down markets and cheaper valuations overall is actually go look for the stuff that's actually cheap right now. And that's the, you know, the further away, you know, you get from the bubble, you know, that's where probably the opportunities are. So if the last decade was about, uh, disinflation and U.S. large cap growth. And I think the opposite of that is probably going to be the real opportunity. So pro-inflation, uh, you know, international small cap value, those are the things that people should be looking at, you know, to take advantage of for the next 10 years. So, Dan, if you also believe then we're in for a period of structural inflation, not structural disinflation, what does that mean for the 60-40 story that people are still married to? Yeah, I think it, it presents a, a, a tough, uh, a tougher scenario for the 60-40. I mean, the, the thing about the 60-40 is that you, it was a very good way, an easy way to just have a buy and hold strategy and sort of mitigate risk. So I think that that story of just the buy and hold strategy on the 40 percent that represents bonds 
that's not going to be the case anymore. I think you can still take advantage of, of bonds uh, and duration in portfolios. Going to be a, it's going to be a lot more tactical in nature. I mean, I think you know, as a starting point, just think back to these periods of of higher inflation. You know, there were huge opportunities to be had. Uh, in bonds and, and duration, but you have to be very tactical. I think one of those opportunities is probably right now. I think the next year, you know, bonds actually present a really attractive opportunity as I think that long, the long end of the curve is probably going to come down as growth slows, you know, but I, when we start to recover, you're going to want to be out of that trade. And so it's going to be a lot more tactical of a 60-40 going forward. Can I talk to you about the tactical story on the equity side as well? So you've given me the more long-term, sustainable, fundamental story on equities, Dan. What about the near term? So Bank of America had this to say on Europe. We think the next big story for markets will be a sharp loss of growth momentum in response to aggressive monetary tightening. This is not yet priced with markets buoyed or buoyed, as you might say, in the United States by strong activity on easing supply issues, fading gas prices and China reopening. So, Dan, I get it in the near term. EM's ripped. China's ripped. China reopening, all of that good stuff. The energy story's faded a bit in Europe as well. Give me the tactical story for stocks in the near term, Dan. Yeah, I think the, the tactical story uh, and theme for the near term, John, is, is very simple and it's, it's very consistent with what, what we've been saying for a while. You know, in an environment where we're just going into a profit recession globally, liquidity is continuing to tighten. Uh, I think that's an environment where you want to, the number one theme in portfolios right now should be defense. Uh, now, there's going to be opportunity, there's going to be periods where, where markets rally. Um, but I think it, this is probably the worst combination of fundamental factors, you know, to, to be, you know, pedal to the metal on risk in portfolios. So I think, you know, for the time being, you want to focus on defense. There will be opportunities. There are opportunities today to play offense, but there are going to be huge opportunities, you know, over the next five to 10 years, you know, to have huge gains and take advantage of that upcoming bull market. But for the time being, when we're just now entering into a profit recession, I think defense is, is probably the more important factor. Let's talk about those opportunities in just a moment. Dan Suzuki is going to stick with us. Coming up on this program, China opening its borders and giving EM a major boost. The China reopening, which we may debate whether it is a global scale event or not, but it's certainly an EM wide relevant event. That conversation up next. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Torsten Muller Atbos, Rolls Royce CEO. That's 10:30 a.m. in New York, 3:30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. The China reopening, which we may debate whether it is a global scale event or not, but it's certainly an EM-wide relevant event. You have very attractive valuations and a dollar cycle that has finally turned, coupled with the peak in interest rates. So we all know it, it's, it's the best time to be overweight emerging markets, both equity and fixed income. China taking a final step in dismantling COVID zero and opening its borders. This as officials consider wider budget deficits to ramp up economic support, driving emerging market equities towards a bull market. For more, Damien Sasser of Bloomberg Intelligence joins us right now. EM equities, mm -hmm. Damien, ripping. Yeah, no, exactly. Markets are looking straight through China's let it rip approach and basically pricing in the good news after the bad, right? I mean, so I think where we are here is it's tactical. I think, you know, I think people have said it on your show earlier, you know, best. I mean, so I, I think it's going to be a tactical upside here. We see broad dollar weakness taking hold. We see EM currencies largely led by the Asia PAC region all rallying. And I'm talking Thai bot. We talked about that just a few days back. It's Korea as well. And so look, that's spilling into the broader EM equity universe. But Jonathan, we must remember that the EM equity universe is China and it's largely four stocks. I'm talking Alibaba, Maituan, JD.com, you know the rest. So, I mean, it's a tech play. And so, how long, how, what are the legs there uh, in this environment with the US coming into recession? The verdict is still out. Have you got a final word on Brazil? So, of course. So, what I mean, basically, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you know, I actually had a deck that came out. It was good timing this morning about how, you know, basically EM practitioners have gotten used to living with geopolitical risk. And we've seen this now in Peru, Chile, Colombia. We're going to see it in Argentina at the end of the year. Jonathan, this is really nothing new for Brazil. We saw riots in 2013 and 2017. Now, the one takeaway here is um, this definitely undermines the credibility of the fiscal of the right, basically, in Brazil. And what that means is that Lula's spending caps, he might, might have a lot more durability to enact a lot more spending throughout the 
the course of his tenure. And so that's bad for the Brazilian Real. And I think the Real is sort of reacting to that at 5.30 this morning. Kevin Hammond, Damien, thank you. It's good to catch up, sir, as always. Damien Sassa there on this massive rally you're seeing in the equity market, in emerging markets. Dan Suzuki of RB Advisors is back with us for a final thought. Now, Dan, if I said rate cuts to people, they'd be throffing at the mouth maybe thinking about buying big tech. And I imagine you're thinking about emerging markets in a bigger way. Is that right? Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, when we talk about emerging markets, I think, you know, I think Damian made the point emerging markets are so heavily dominated by China, you know, that that really drives the story. And if that's the case, you know, I think there is a reason be, to be more optimistic on uh, emerging markets at large. But for me, I, I really see a, a tale of two different, two different stories. Really, you have China and everything else in the world. I mean, pretty much everything else out there is seeing, you know, slowing profits and tighten liquidity. The reason that China specifically is so interesting to us right now is that it's doing the exact opposite of everything else in the world. Just as the world is about to tip into a global profits recession, China is actually look poised to exit their profits recession. And at the same time, they're trying to pump liquidity into supporting their markets. And so that's a very, very different story than what global central bankers are doing. So I think a lot of that story is very specific to China. And so I think that's probably the best way to play it. Is that my new diversification, my uncorrelated asset? <laughs> it's, it's definitely one of them, Jonathan. I think, uh, you know, for the last, you know, people don't haven't really come to terms with this, but over the last, you know, four three or four years, China has been consistently, you know, counter cyclical as the world was, you know, entering into the pandemic freeze, you know, China was actually held holding up the best as the world was coming out and surging, you know, on the bit on the back of uh, policy stimulus, you know, China was a huge laggard. And now as the world again is tipping into a profit recession, China is doing the opposite. So I think from that sense, China does make a great area of portfolio diversification today. Dan, Damien's still with me. I wanted to give him the final word on that. Damien, I think this is such an important point coming into 23. Yeah, no, I have to agree with one thing that Dan mentioned here. China government bonds, I, I, look, they were down 5.2% last year. That's the best performance of any fixed income asset class writ large. Chinese government bonds have been a good diversifier for your sort of core fixed income portfolio. But talking about China bonds and talking about Chinese equities are two entirely different things, right? So Chinese equities, while I take everything that Dan's saying about, you know, margin improvement, about revenues, I mean, it's going to snap back, certainly with the, with, with the COVID reopening. But yeah, you know, there's still a lot of risk in that market. And so, look, I agree with you you need to have some exposure zero is not the right number but two and a half five percent i mean it starts to it, it's risk you. What, you know you know what i mean it's how, it's how much you yeah. allocate to that risk. this is the third year though of pandemic economics and it gets extended by china reopening and dan if we can finish there i think it would be beneficial for all of us on the demand side it's pretty obvious to me how this works out it's obvious to all of us you get more demand great we reopen on the supply side dan it's less obvious to me whether we get supply chain relief or further supply side dislocations because of that burst in demand. Dan, from your perspective, which one is it? Yeah, I think it's more I think it's more the former. I mean really, you know, the one big you know, question mark for global markets today is, you know, how fast is the reopening gonna be? And if it is really fast, you know, that is gonna, you know, do a do a great uh, service to the rest of the world because the, the reality is demand everywhere else is slowing. So there is excess capacity. We're not going to have those supply chain issues if it's really just China that's holding up the world. So I think from that perspective, um, you know, that excess demand that's going to shield, you know, global, uh, you know, the global economy a little bit. I think that's generally going to be a positive. And, and I think the supply chain issues, you know, sure, sure there will be some targeted areas. Um, but I, I don't think it's going to be it's going to be much more of a positive story. I think I think we all know one thing with confidence that the consensus is going to be wrong on something, something very, very big. And I just can't work out what it is. Dan Suzuki. <laughs> thank you, sir. It's good to catch up, buddy. And to Damien. Damien Sasse there of Bloomberg Intelligence. Thank you. Equities are up here about 23 minutes into the session, up eight tenths of one percent on the S&P with some sector price action. Here's Abby. Yeah, and that gain is important, John, because we're looking at the first five days, at least right now, of January being higher. Some say that that is a positive omen for the year relative to sectors. Not surprisingly, most of them are higher. Tech is the best, up 1.8 percent. Discretionary up 1.77 percent, despite the uh, drag of Lululemon. And Lululemon is actually down for a second year in a row, down about seven percent this year, uh, in contrast to what 
we were talking about earlier, consumer staples and healthcare defense. Investors not wanting it. And take a look at the China trade. You were just talking about it. We have the NASDAQ uh, Gold and Dragon Index up 1.8 percent higher with energy. And we also uh, have lots of hope that that reopening trade is fully in play there. Abby, thank you. Stocks building on the gains from Friday. The S&P up by eight tenths of one percent. Your trading diary up next.